All right, so let's have a look at problem 9.32 from week 8. This is the first time we're going to encounter a cycle. Okay, this is an auto cycle. And we'll have to... I'll split this video into two because there's a lot of information to be covered on this. So on the first part of the video, I'll talk a bit about the theory and a little introduction on this. And then on the second part, I'll actually tackle A, B, C, and D. All right. So we have an ideal auto cycle with air as a working fluid, and it has a compression ratio of 8. At the beginning of the compression process, air is at 95 kilopascals and 27 Celsius, and 750 kilojoules per kilogram of heat is transferred to the air during the constant volume heat addition process. Take into account the variation of specific heat to temperature, determine the pressure and the temperature at the end of the heat addition process. The net work output, thermal efficiency, and the mean effective pressure for the cycle. Okay, so what do we need to know to be able to solve this? Well, first of all, we need to know what an auto cycle is. Okay, you're going to have to know that. An auto cycle is one that has, just like the one that I drew here on the bottom, um, it's one that has two isentropic processes and two isovolumetric ones. Okay, so let's actually draw this here. This guy here. Okay, so what is what? What am I saying? Well, first we have an isentropic compression going from one to two. Okay. Well, actually, before we even say that, note that this process here is clockwise, right? So we go from one to two, two to three, three to four, and four to one. And we always, because it's a cycle, we always go back to where we started. Okay, that's the first thing to note. Second thing to note is, um, first process we have from one to two, that's an isentropic process. Okay, so no change in entropy, and it's an isentropic compression. How do we know it's a compression? Well, if you look, we have a PV diagram, right? And we're going from a higher volume to a smaller volume. So that's why I know it's a compression. Okay, then what do we have? We have a Isovolumetric, no change in volume, heat addition. Okay, so for us to go up here from 2 to 3, we're going up in energy scale. We need to add energy to the system, and we do that by adding heat. So that's where I know my Q in comes in. So that's where I know this is where I'm going to have a Q in. Okay, then we have a iso isentropic expansion. Okay, how do I know again? Just looking at the volume, I can see my volume increases, so I'm going from here to here, right? I'm increasing the volume. And then we top it off with another isovolumetric, but then we have a heat rejection part. Okay, let me remind you guys that the um, work done by this system, right, on the compression, this is the work over here, so the area underneath this curve for the compression. The work for the um, expansion is going to be this area over here, right? And since our expansion has given us work and our compression is actually uh, using some of this work, some of this energy, the output of the system is this area inside here, right? Because it's going to be the area of the 3 4 process minus the area for the 1 2 process, right? Cool. So those are some things for us to know before we even start. Okay, next thing. What is the um, compression ratio that is said in the beginning? So if we look here, it says the fluid has a compression ratio of 8. Okay, so the compression ratio is a ratio between the maximum volume I have in my system and the minimum volume. So right here on the bottom. Okay, so what is what am I saying? I'm saying that if, for instance, my original V, my V, uh, initial is, I don't know, 10 meters cubed per kilogram, then this guy is going to be 80 meters cubed per kilogram, because there's a ratio of 8, 8 between the two of them, okay? So in other words, my maximum volume is 8 times, or 8 fold my original one. Okay, this is going to be particularly useful when we're solving this. Also useful to note that my volume 1 and my volume 4, so my volume 1 and 4 are the same, right, because it's ISO volumetric. Likewise, my volume 2 and 3 are the same, right? So when we talk about the maximum volume, like we're doing here on this part here, 
this can be either my volume 1 or my volume 4, it doesn't matter because they're the same and my minimum volume can be either 2 or 3, it doesn't matter because they're the same right, so what else taking, check out this hash part here, taking into account the variation of specific heat right, we know that CP and CV CP and CV and CP they're both functions of t temperature, right? So if we need to take into account their variations, that means we can't just use an average CP or CV. So that means we can't use the CP, CV approach, and we have to use a table information to be able to solve this. Okay? And then last but not least, check out that um, the way the information is given, and this is going to be the case from, for all the cycles from now on, is it says... At the beginning of the compression process, air is 95 and 27 Celsius. Okay, so it doesn't tell you this is 1, 2, 3, or 4. So this is up to you to, the, to know, right? Because if you know that, you need to know where is the compression process. Well, I we know compression is from here to here. So the beginning of the compression process is going to be my 1. So therefore, what they're saying is P1 and T1 are 95 and 27. Right? And also, the... 750 that is transferred in the um, heat addition process that happens here so we have 750 going on here so from 2 to 3 okay so all of those things you need to know the cycle so that you can determine right it's not given um, as easily as before so with that said make sure that you know all your cycles it's best to know them little by little than try to crank them all up by the end of the semester, right? Okay, and then the last thing I have from our introduction is the following. Check out that this is the information that we were given, so this is the information that we have to start with, right? And then there's a relationship, there's an important relationship between my um, relative pressures and my relative specific volumes, right? You probably learned about that in the lecture, I'm happy to go over it in more details in our class, but these guys, whenever we have an isentropic transformation, there's a very important relationship, so let's go over here and have a look, okay? So whenever, this is the relationship here, whenever we have an isentropic transformation, right, the ratio between the volumes equals the ratio between the relative specific volumes, right? Likewise, if we, if we were to have pressure, same thing applies. The ratio between the pressures on an isentropic process equals the ratio between the relative pressures. Okay? Why, why am, what am I saying? Why am I telling you guys that? Well, before I move on, just please remember this only is valid when it's isentropic, so when delta S is zero, right? If it's not isentropic, you cannot use this relationship here in yellow. Okay, please remember that, because you guys love to forget this. Okay, so what are these specific, relative specific volume and specific pressures? Okay, so they come from the relationship of um, entropy, and we don't need to go into detail, but if you guys recall, there's an equation that relates, it's hard to write here, it relates the um, entropies and R, log of the pressures and so forth. Okay, it comes from this equation. And then it's a property that is only dependent on entropy. Okay? And since we know, so that means that PR is a function of entropy. And since we know entropy is a function of temperature, right, that means that PR therefore is a function of temperature. Likewise, if we just use the uh, ideal gas relationship, <clears throat> we can find that the specific relative, sorry, the relative specific volume is also only dependent on the temperature. Okay? Because it's dependent on PR and temperature, and PR is dependent on temperature, so therefore the same thing applies. Okay? So these guys, they are useful because they are linked thermodynamically only to the temperature. So if we have the temperature of any given case, we can find PR. If we have PR, we can find the temperature. 
there's only one PR for one temperature for every gas. Okay, same thing applies for VR. If we have the temperature, we can find VR. If we have VR, we can find the temperature. And if it's an isentropic transformation, we can use that relationship, the ratios between the, um, the two states to solve our problem. Okay, so let's have a quick look at this cycle here. We have two isentropic transformations. So we have from 1 to 2 and from 3 to 4. So if I want to know, for instance, I know my ratio is 8. Let's see, I know my ratio is 8. Okay. And because I have my first state completely defined, I have uh, P1, I have T1, I can grab out of the table what is my VR1. So this is going to be a known value for me. And then since this relationship here is valid because it's an isentropic process, I can find my VR2. If I have my VR2, I define the whole state, right? Because that's the beauty of using these kinds of values, because I don't need now to find two things to define a state. Because since everything is dependent on temperature, and by everything I mean enthalpy, internal energy, uh, specific relative specific volume, relative pressure, entropy, so, because all those things are dependent on temperature, as long as I define one of them, I can find all the others, right? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a relationship between um, my VR1 and V8, and I'm going to find that my VR2 is 77.65. And once I have that, I define my second state, and I can go ahead, that's all I need to find my state, I can go ahead and I can go to table E17, and I can grab the temperature for T2, by interpolation, and I can grab my internal energy for T2 by interpolation as well. Okay, so before I even jump into A, B, C, and D, what I can already have, can grab, what I grab is from table E17, and I'll show you the table in a second, I can grab, sorry, I can grab my internal energy, and you'll see why in a minute, and I can grab my VR1. So this guy here is VR1. Okay. And then I did this on purpose over here, check it out. I've put the units for a specific volume, okay? Because students love to forget that this is a relative specific volume. It's only the main they share, all right? Because one is a volume, the other one is a temperature or a thermodynamic property related to temperature. So there's no unit here, right? Let's go back. I'm going to stop this video and we're going to continue from this point on, from the point in which we have define my first state completely, I have my uh, internal energy, I have my VR1, I have my VR2, I have my temperature 2, I have my internal energy 2. Okay, so I'm going to start this video and we'll continue the next video only talking about solving A, B, C and D for this problem.